I want to talk a little bit about money. And as you know, whenever you start talking about money, it's, it's uh, as one negotiator commented uh, two, three cups ago, that uh, things are going fine, we are in agreement as long as we don't discuss money. Uh, so here I want to talk a little bit about this FIB, uh, a new acronym into the alphabet soup uh, that, that has not been added formally yet. Just need to find out which button. Here we go. Um, reference level has two meanings, at least to me as a, as a scientist. One is in the meaning of a, of a technical a business as usual, which is what we use in all project analysis, setting a benchmark for measuring impact. Does this policy work? Did this project make a difference? We need a, a, a benchmark for that. There is another term that we have called financial incentive benchmark, which is a more politically, it's basically answering this question, from what point should a country or a project, I'm talking mainly at national level here, should we start paying, compensating that project or country for reducing emissions? And these are two very different, and in the negotiation they haven't really dealt with this FIB or crediting or compensating baseline, as we also have used as a term, because it has considered too political. But I think conceptually it's very confusing. If you have some pets at home, it's useful to call something a cat and something a dog. So you, for example, you know how to deal with them and what food to give, not just call them pets or domestic animals. In the same way here, what are we talking about? One is primarily a technical thing, how to predict deforestation, degradation and the associated emissions, and the second is a political, assigning responsibility. So what I would like to do in this presentation is to go a bit through on the second part, what can be the relevant considerations. Um, the very easiest thing would be to say that, okay, let's, let's set this financial incentive benchmark or crediting baseline equal to the business as usual. That's not a good idea. And I will argue why it's not a good idea. The very simple reason is that it's too expensive. Uh, and money are scarce, so we want to use them in the best possible way. That's why economists exist to answer that question. Now, the key ch challenge, therefore, is to create a mechanism that both give these strong incentives for emission reductions, and it's not too costly. It's something we can afford. Or if we can approach it from another way, how to spend a given amount of money, 4.5 or so billion dollars provided through the Red Partnership, how can we spend them most effectively? to get the most bang for the bucks, the most emission reductions for that amount. And very important is considered, is it fair, is it equitable, is it acceptable to all parties in that way? Which I like to see political acceptability as a function of its effectiveness, the cost and the distribution of that and how it's considered, what we call the, the three E's, the effectiveness, efficiency and equity. Um, in a lot of the text on, on UN uh, for, that come out of these COPs and the SEPSTA meetings is related to how to set reference level. There are two things, two key words in that. One is historical, the other is national circumstances. And from time to time, one tries to open the black box of national circumstances and, and specify what it is. And that has been some, also an area of contention. This uh, national circumstances, I think it's, it's relevant to, to split them in two. Some are relevant for setting the baseline. I mean, these are important to predict deforestation and business as usual scenario. And then there are others that, that are here for, to more decide what should be a reasonable financial incentives benchmark for that. And there can be other considerations. I'm not going to talk about this. We have done some work at C4. Uh, related to this, how to predict this, not easy, but some progress, I would say, have been made, but I'm focusing on this part. Five things I would like to mention. Additionality, participation constraints, effectiveness or efficiency, fair sharing and uncertainty. And here comes a little bit for those who, who chose not to take economics, you can grasp up a little bit here. This is the margin cost curve. So we start with some some emissions here, I put it on the negative and red is kind of reducing those emissions, moving to the right. So in business as usual, and you start here, low cost initially, cheap reforms that you can do almost 
almost not worth clearing this forest. And this expanding um, or gradually increasing margin costs of red. Now the first thing to say, we want payments to be additional. What does that mean for how this FIB should be set in relation to the business as usual? Well, there are two versions. One is to say that, okay, the end result, the realized emissions, countries will reduce emissions up to the point where the margin cost is just equal to the price or the compensation they are paid. So at least in theory, and let's stick to theory for the time being. Additionality is just the same that the realized emissions are lower than the, uh, uh, that the, the realized emissions are lower than the, uh, uh, than, than the business as usual. A stronger is to say that every dollars or every kroner or euro spent or every rupiah in Indonesia spent should be uh, additional. So the FIB should at least be to the right of this business as usual. So we should not start out here. Uh, so that's the second version of that. Excuse me, sorry to interrupt your conversation. It'd probably be better if you spoke into this, so when you turn your head, everyone can hear what you're saying. Okay. That's better. Um, I'm used to, to pointing at this, so we look at the same thing. Um, the second is to say that, okay, countries should not lose from, from, from participating, which is in some theoretical work called the participation constraint. It should be beneficial to make. And this is, if you think of the real reducing up to this point. These are the costs in this area under here, and the payment should be this, this uh, rectangular between the realized emissions and the FIB. Here they start paying. So what, what is the requirement for this? Well, it is to say that this costs under here should not be higher than this total compensation paid here. So basically A should, be, should not be larger than this area C. And if you have this, this uh, convex cost curves that you normally get, it means that this can be set quite a bit lower than the business as usual. Uh, more than 50% of the distance here to the, to the right here. So if you take that seriously and think that this has something to do with the way it works, you already have here a strong argument for setting this like this. The third is on the effectiveness. And the effectiveness is basically well, it depends on how, what system you have, but today we have mainly fund, it's a fund-based system, not really through the market. So it's to maximize effect, effectiveness given a particular fund. How can we use it? Well, the money you have to spend is this area here. So, and if you start, say, putting the FIB equals to business as usual, it means the area, you will get a very low price of carbon here. Uh, and you may be, say, only up to this point here. If you say we pay, start paying only from after some of the initial reductions and then we pay the price of carbon, the price you can pay on the margin is a lot higher. Now this principle that comes out of this is to compensate only the real costs, which may have some trade-offs. And Khrushchev, the old Soviet Union leader, was right and say that economists, or he didn't say economists, economics do not respect wishful thinking. So we cannot have it all here. There are trade-offs. We should only compensate real costs. So big surpluses for poor countries for development. If we have, think of this as a thought experiment, we only want to maximize emission reductions. Then, and in, a in a, this kind of scheme where we pay for results in terms of reduced emissions, then there are some trade-offs between this carbon and other objectives. It's not, I'm not saying how they should be balanced, but I'm just, arguing that it exists. There are, of course, other ways to, to, to deal with this, to maximize effectiveness, just to mention this. Maybe we shouldn't all the time try to overburden the reference level and put all the good considerations into that. Fair sharing. In the early red discussion, for those of you who remember that, we had the development adjustment factor that's kind of gone out of the debate. PNG and others was pushing that hard those days, but it has gone out of the debate. But if what it, would it be reasonable to have the FIB based, for example, on the level of, of income of the countries? Uncertainty, which is there and, and has been talked about. And there are a lot of options for dealing with that uncertainty. I have to rush a little bit. Uh, one is to say that we have an ex post adjustment, as some have suggested in the literature, some French authors have put this forward. 
So you have a formula, you say that we are just a reference level based on, for example, observed agricultural prices, because that's an important driver. High prices, higher pressure on deforestation, higher business as usual. So we do that after that is, uh, that is done. So we agree on the formula and that the actual results is based on, on a, a ex post a reference level. A corridor approach, which I have some sympathy for, which is to say that, okay, for the initial reductions, you have a low payment, but it's gradually increasing. And that's a way to say that, okay, we don't know exactly where this, this uh, reference level, even the business as usual is, so let's move gradually. Small reductions, small payments. Uh, the conservativeness factor that you have. We have a stepwise approach and we say that if there is high uncertainty with the data underlying, okay, we multiply it or you have a reduction here by 0 0.5, 0 0.6 or whatever until the, we have the more highest step three level data where there is little uh, reduction in terms of this. We have a couple of other ideas that I don't have time to go into. Uh, we just as an example, we made a particular pro, uh, proposal in a report for DEC in the UK, how we can do this based on this. And I'm not going through all the details here, but just to say that if we start here with a country that has low deforestation, we may adjust it because they're early in the forest transition for a highest business as usual deforestation. Then we deduct some based on the, on the cost that some of these are cheap, so we start compensating after that but and make sure that overall the transfer covers the net costs. And then you may have some on fair sharing on the level of GDP and perhaps some uncertainty at the end. For another country starting high, ending up quite much lower than this. I think it's important to tackle some of these difficult issues and not just say that they are too hard, but say what would be a reasonable consideration to include when we start discussing these difficult issues. So we look at the business as usual, what is the likely scenario, what are the costs, what are the capacities, what would be a fair sharing, and how to deal with uncertainty. And these are, I mean, an idea for how to start dealing with this. Of course, a lot of the specifications will be debatable. It will probably lead to a lower this financial incentive benchmark compared to the business as usual reference level as it's used in, in the general debate. But it's at least something one can afford. And to come up with nice proposals to save the world's forest, they are excellent on paper, except one thing, we don't have the money to do that. That's not very useful. So when you design it, make it realistic in terms of the overall cost. And this is a step towards that to make it something we can afford. Deal with uncertainty, the stepwise approach that gives strong incentives also to upgrade the MRV and, and reference level setting systems. And the corridor approach with this reduced uncertainty for both parties and it's a practical way of doing it uh, that, uh, that I think is worth also considering bringing into negotiations. So some of this you can read more in the book and in other reports that will come out soon. So thank you.